Okay, let me check and I will get your biography. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, um, André is, uh, I, I don't know the words, just to give a description of what he does, so you will give your own introduction, okay? okay. He's an independent security consultant that has worked around Europe. It is specialized in malware and APTs, okay? Uh, he has worked, uh, for example, pardon, sorry, pardon. <coughs> He's in the security community working uh, abroad in Europe, and he has given uh, speeches everywhere, for example, in Black oh, Hat, no. in Recon, <laughs> <laughs> in TechEd, uh, and in the cyber defense uh, bootcamp that uh, NATO developed in Europe. Okay, and now in RootedCon. Thank you a lot, Andre, yeah. and you have the audience. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Buenos tardes, amigos de la Rooted. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'll have to speak uh, English because I, sadly, I can't speak Spanish. So uh, I guess some of you will need these headphones. Um, if that makes you feel better, I need those headphones for all the other speeches, and uh, uh, you need it just for one. So, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually not that frequent speaker, uh, to be honest. Uh, there are speakers that uh, speak uh, a lot more frequently, but um, but yeah, I'm mainly um, uh, doing malware analysis, forensics, uh, incident handling, this kind of uh, this kind of stuff. Um, my talk today will be about uh, something that's called Turla, and um, this is. I think one of the most uh, successful cyber espionage uh, operation that has been ongoing for the last couple of years and is still ongoing. And uh, the presentation, I will uh, split the presentation to development of the Turla Toolkit and the operations. That, so the operations would be uh, about those who use the toolkit, the operators, should we say. And then uh, I will also as, uh, because I, I have also worked on Regin, which is another one, uh, another cyber espionage malware. Um, I will make a little bit of comparison here and there, because I think it's interesting to see how, how they compare to each other. Okay, so let's start. Um, I'll go with a, with a small introduction, then I'll cover the two parts, and at the end, I will tell you how to, how to try to detect uh, this threat and uh, maybe protect against it, and I'll speculate uh, a little bit on the attribution. So let's start uh, with the introduction. Um, I'll give you first a bit of history of my, from my pers perspective, so based on my fight with this uh, threat over the, the couple of years. So the first... Uh, uh, mentioned ever on the internet about the public uh, about this uh, threat is uh, on the uh, famous threat expert blog uh, uh, entry that is called Agent BTZ Threat That Hit Pentagon. The blog entry made by Sergei Shevchenko, uh, currently working at BAE Systems. And there uh, on that blog, uh, Sergei says that uh, he has identif identified a malware that is able to to cross the air gap, so spread from um, uh, networks that are not physically connected, um, but he's missing some components because he cannot explain some files that malware creates and things like that. Uh, so in 2009, I was working on an incident uh, that involves Agent BTZ, involved Agent BTZ activity, and at that time, uh, I was uh, able to find these uh, missing components and pull the toolkit back together. In, uh, then, for two years, I have not seen anything related to, to it. it. But in 2011, uh, there was a big uh, case, and uh, we have gathered together with some researchers from the region uh, where I work, and we have um, 
analyzed a, ver a quite sophisticated uh, malware sample, a rootkit, that we first didn't know that it's related to Agent BTZ, but it, it, it turned out later on that, uh, that it's all related. We have, in 2013, we have uh, written uh, a document because we handled that incident, analyzed the malware, but it turns out that this uh, knowledge and uh, the outcome of that analysis is not shared to other organizations in Europe. And, and incidents related to these threat actors were popping up uh, here and there um, after this 2011 case. We decided that we need to write something and distribute it in a sort of TLP Amber way to, um, to organizations in Europe so that they can, they can protect this. Uh, document uh, has then been made public last year. Um, beginning uh, 2014, a big change, uh, Snake uh, comes public. Uh, the first uh, blog that has been published uh, uh, was published uh, by GData and then followed by a good report from BAE Systems uh, from the same Sergey that did the 2008 uh, Agent BTZ uh, blog post, and yeah, this is what that presentation is about. I want to cover this, um, um, all this information that has been published, gather it somehow together, and try to give you a big picture, a bigger picture, because there is a lot of confusion. Uh, um, different companies, they call uh, uh, different um, malware, in the same way, and uh, you know that creates a lot of confusion, I think. So let's maybe review what has been published regard, re, uh, regarding Turla so far. So the famous blog post I have already mentioned. 2000, December 2003, uh, at 13, so before the disclosure of Snake, there was an interesting Trend Micro art article about a Windows XP a zero day payload. Uh, it was a, actually a privileged escalation payload, payload that, co that contained the kernel mode shellcode, so quite an interesting vulnerability. And um, Trent didn't know that it's related to, to Turla. It, ter it, turns out, it turned out later on that it, they are actually describing the so-called um, validation agent or entry point agent, uh, or in the NSA slang that would be called validator, validator agent or something like that. I'm, based on the Snowden leaks. Um, so February 2014, um, GData uh, publishes uh, first, and then a series of disclosure follows. And it, it's until now uh, they get published. Uh, every month uh, there is a security vendor that publishes something about Turla. So we have uh, BAE Systems. That's a very good report. Here, uh, Sergey already can define the two main branches of, uh, of uh, Turla, which is one is, they call it a user, user mode centric uh, snake and kernel mode centric snake, uh, which is a very good observation. There is a, a, a really nice piece of uh, reverse engineering described in that, uh, in that thing. Then uh, we have made, we, me and Matthew Kaczmarek, uh, who is also known as uh, Tekamak, we have decided to publish our document publicly. You can. Google it, um, yeah, pretty hardcore reversing in there also. Um, Sourcefire and F-Secure, uh, their blog uh, posts fo are focusing on the exploit exploitation part of the Turla activity. Um, there are some kernel mode info threads that uh, are also interesting. Um, this one, uh, the one that I have in mind, it describes how they implement the patch guard bypass in 64-bit uh, windows. Um, Circle, so the Cer Luxembourgish CERT, they published uh, an analy analysis of uh, one variant of the Turla uh, malware. Uh, Semantic gives some geographical and contextual information Kaspersky has a good article about the, the, yeah, the exploitation part of the Turla uh, activity. I will, I will explain everything later on, uh, what the exploitation part is and stuff like that. Um, yeah, GData, since, uh, since Paul Rascanier has joined GData, uh, he publishes uh, quite a lot. Uh, uh, there are some interesting 
things in there too. Uh, the evolution of sophisticated spyware, for example, this one. Uh, this one describes uh, the history of one of the version of uh, yeah, of um, Turla malware. So, so I already uh, highlighted some problems with that. There is many publications, many names. Uh, one vendor refers to certain name, uh, and the other vendors uses the same name to describe something else. Uh, so I'd like to. Uh, sort it out a little bit. Um, and we will start uh, from the development. Uh, so I will speak now about the code itself, how it's created and, 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 and so on, and then I will cover the operations, so the ones that use the code, because I'm deeply convinced it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same group yeah, of people or organization. Um, so, what is Turla in the context of development? I see it as a family of related sophisticated backdoor software. The name Turla comes from uh, the, the Microsoft, the old Microsoft detection signature, uh, and it's, a, it's actually an anagram of Ultra because Ultra 3 was the name of the fake driver that, uh, that uh, Turla was uh, masquerading as. So all these Turla versions are relate, uh, related by shared code, and uh, from my perspective, it looks uh, more like this, um, that uh, there are three main branches. First, uh, chronologically, first was Agent BTZ, and then uh, on the base on this code, uh, PFINet was created, and then Snake is the most advanced um, piece of uh, version or family of this toolkit. Um, Interesting thing is that they are the, all three separately, they are still alive, they are still developed. That is described by these arrows that's going down. So in 2014, uh, some of the agent BTZ samples were found also. <coughs> but, sorry, but these, um, these are not really uh, major changes. There are some updates ongoing, but the important thing is that um, they are still used. As you can see, these names are all being made by security companies. Some of these names are actually the actual names of the toolkit that the developer use, developers use. So for, for example, we have Chinch. Uh, the agent BTZ malware um, is in reality called Chinch by, by their creators, but that's a detail. Uh, this here, I think, oh, this was a little bit too early. Sorry, I have to find it back. Okay, so um, interesting thing here uh, is that um, PFINet has a one of a sub branch of the code where they don't include the kernel mode driver. I think it's a kind of interesting uh, evolution concept or the direction that that uh, some creators of these toolkit toolkits take because also there is a one uh, one regin sample that. Um, that has been found uh, that has no kernel mode driver, we, whereas the previous one that I saw had. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, for those who don't know, Regin is uh, the toolkit. Uh, yeah, this is very sophisticated malware that is probably used by GCHQ, as the Snowden leaks uh, tell. Um, so let me now try to to have an overview on the features that uh, these toolkits provide to the, uh, yeah, the functionalities, should we say. As you can see already here, uh, I, can, I can highlight some differences uh, between uh, the feature. Uh, the, for example, simple example is the storage. Agent BTZ had a, has, had a, uh, a hidden folder uh, that was just implemented in the kernel to hide a folder, not show it from the user mode. But, PFI and that Snake, they, they go further and they implement the encrypted virtual file system. So this is a container that they can use as a storage, invisible in the system. And this is, this is I, I think this is the trend where all these sophisticated software now go. I won't cover it here on this slide, all the rest, because I will, co I will cover uh, them in detail in the, on the next slides. So what other interesting features are are implemented by Turla. So um, 
Well, that is a, a very interesting one, I think. Uh, uh, so, um, some of you might know that uh, Windows, uh, the 64-bit versions of Windows, they implement something that's called driver signature enforcement or something like that. It basically, it basically prevents uh, loading of unsigned drivers into the kernel. The driver has to be signed by a valid certificate. So they actually have a problem here because they don't implement any bootkits or firm, firmware malware, yet they have to load the driver uh, for the 64-bit uh, window. So what they use is they take an old virtual box driver that has a uh, vulnerability that allows to run the kernel mode code through that vulnerability. This driver has long been patched by, by the vendor, but the signature somehow hasn't been revoked, uh, and it's not only the problem with, uh, with VirtualBox, because according to Kaspersky, uh, equation team that is uh, supposedly run by NSA, they also use the same techniques. So, so I think there is, you can find, uh, you know, like 100 uh, of all drivers patched. You can patch them, but they can still tell, find on the internet somewhere this file bring that file with their toolkit when they install it and just load it in the, into the kernel. I mean, uh, I don't know uh, how you see this, but I see the, I, I, the con my conclusion is that the driver code signing is, is, is just useless. I, I, I think this, this has to change. Um, so uh, another interesting technique used by, uh, by uh, Turla is the, the usage of uh, the, the open source disassembler and they use it, they disassemble code on the fly in, inside the kernel mode code, so it's, it's like uh, walking on a thin line because it can all crash, but they actually implement it. It, it, it is pretty reliable. Uh, so, for example, from the document that um, me and my friend wrote here, um, they use it, it's, this, is, this one is uh, an interesting one. They, they need a functionality to, tell the, to, to force the API to think an API, so some API, to think that it's, it's been called from uh, kernel mode. But Windows doesn't provide that functionality. What it provides is the, the opposite function, which is called X get previous mode. That function will tell the API where it was called from, the kernel or the user mode. So, but they, they uh, need the opposite functionality. So what they do, they disassemble the get previous mode they find some assembly instructions uh, like MOV, and they take their operands, they flip, they flip it, they assemble it back, and there they have set previous mode that doesn't exist. So that's, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, the hooking engine is also implemented by the disassembler. With the use of the disassembler, they actually disassemble. It's the inline hooks, what they implement, and um, they disassemble the first few bytes, so-called stolen bytes, and um, they change the relative offset to absolute off offset using some formulas, kind of funny stuff also. They use a, a, a new uh, a software interrupt that they declare in, inside the kernel, and then, the, then uh, they, um, to hook the function, they just call this, uh, the, this new software uh, interrupt, uh, to actually to, yeah. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, I, I'm highlighting which families implement which feature. This is used in the all three, although in Agent BTZ is way more visible. In Snake, this UD86 uh, is not visible straight away because strings are, you know, obfuscated and stuff like that. Um, the encrypted VFS start, it's uh, implemented since PFINET. Uh, uses encryption, CAST, well, they like CAST 128 uh, encryption. Um, they use it everywhere. And it's basically, the encryption is implemented uh, on the sector operation level, so read-write sector. Uh, there is a hook installed when Windows calls, for example, read sector. Um, the hook will transfer the, the call to, to the rootkit code. That rootkit call will submit uh, the request to another thread that it runs, and that thread we will uh, decrypt it. It's actually this one. This is the thread that, is, that performs the decryption or encryption. And then, 
once the, op the, op the crypto operation uh, is completed, uh, the other thread that is waiting uh, will be deblocked. And uh, in this way, Windows uh, is not aware that it's, it's going. How, does it, how, how is it used by the operators? You can see it here. <coughs> so they actually perform a uh, dear command, for example. And they, the important thing that there is a special path that starts with backslash backslash dot backslash hd1 in this case, although this, this, is, this can be changed from the deployment to deployment of the toolkit. Um, this is the name of the hidden partition. And as you can see uh, on my sample infected system, I issued this dir, dir command and you can see some files there. Uh, normally on uh, Windows without the rootkit, you, you won't see anything. Uh, this encrypted container where these data, data are really located is located in the file, something like that. These numbers are random from deployment to deployment. Um, they actually implement two uh, virtual file systems. The other one is uh, just a volatile file system. So the, the, the one that I was talking about is permanent. Data will stay there. Uh, the volatile one, they will disappear after reboot. It's like slash TMP uh, in Linux. So configuration mechanism is another functionality or feature that evolved uh, significantly. So in agent BTZ case, there was practically no, it was not configurable. Everything was hard coded. So the builder of the malware had to hard code certain values there. Whereas PFINet already has a, a, a text uh, file, configuration file, a text one. Uh, where it defines some peers, where it uh, communicates to. And Snake takes this a little bit further. So it uses something that they call Q file, the, the developers. And that Q file is actually a binary key value store. Uh, why did they do it this way? I think that uh, because Snake is the kernel mode centric, uh, as BAE system calls it. And in generally, the kernels, they prefer, they strongly prefer machine-friendly um, uh, data structures. Uh, yeah, the text file is not really very good for the kernel. I think that's why they, they actually decided to, 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 to implement it in a way that it's, it's more like machine-friendly. Uh, last known uh, sample of Snake is from July 2014. There is a a very significant <coughs> change implemented there, which I, excuse me, I, I cannot speak as of yet. Um, next feature that is only implemented in Snake is the modular uh, cover channels. So basically, it's about the communication, how it communicates with different instances and in, uh, with uh, operators. And here, for example, you uh, it's, it basically works in a way like uh, building something from the basic blocks. You know, each of these basic blocks, they implement a separate features. So for example, they, have, they can use this block, which implements encryption, fragmentation, reliability. Then they can connect this to, for example, TCP. Uh, the blocks have to match the type. So this one is ending in orange, so it has to connect to one of these, you know, this is the way it's, it internally works. But I won't stop too, too long on that slide because uh, I think what, uh, what's, uh, yeah, this, this is how, how it's connected. And this is, these are the real examples of um, the cover channels that Snake use. Uh, the interesting thing is that, yeah, that's, that one is long. This is the fragmentation, encryption, reliability, everything here. There. And this is the name pipe, named pipe. Uh, transport here, so it's 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 actually communicates via via name pipes. <coughs> name pipes are are also used to as an interface between kernel mode and user mode, and the same data structures are implemented on the user mode part as the kernel mode part. The code is actually shared. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does this use on the wire? Uh, how how does this look like on the wire? So they can choose uh, many protocols. Uh, there is even one protocol that is below the IP layer. It's implemented on the layer two. I don't know why would they use that, but uh, it's, it's, it's by default enabled, uh, actually. 
Um, so these datagram cover channels are mainly used, um, I think, between um, the different instances on the same infected network, but when they want to connect to the operators over the internet, they will use some of these stream cover channels. Like they have, they can choose different HTTP cover channel. One is hidden in URL, one is using cookies, <coughs> things like that. I'll give you an example of how these two of these channels work. One is the SMTP channel. So imagine now that um, Snake is sitting somewhere on the exchange server of the, of the organization or, you know, SMTP server. So, and the operators connect. So they connect, the real server responds. Um, so they go on with the SMTP uh, protocol. Uh, the real server responds. Then, and then this, this, there is an important line. Um, the, um, so if the user uh, part of the email address uh, has, is 10 characters long and they, the last two characters match a form, formula that I described here, rootkit kicks in. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, rootkit takes over this connection from the real server. So the real server has to forget about this and uh, continues to communicate with the operators and the operators can send commands uh, in the data part of the SMTP dialog. HTTP is uh, similar, but this is the example of the cookie one. So um, in, in, uh, in, in the, and some HTTP header, excuse me, um, they uh, have to match the same formula to, so that they, they have to use the, the two characters checksum, but they, they do additional check on that one. And I think it's because to eliminate, eliminate false positives or something like that. The funny part is that <coughs> the, the words that we saw in real incidents, they actually form a real uh, phrase. You see that's true burger. They could have used something like eight characters and then calculate the two last, the two last ones, but it would never m make like a complete word. It's, it's strange, but it's like this. Uh, important to note for the ones who want to detect it, the connections are not visible in the web server log file because the rootkit will take over it before the web server reaches it. That's, that makes it more difficult to to analyze the incident and to detect it. Uh, snort signatures are also kind of difficult to create, but it's possible to create uh, Lua uh, rules uh, for Suricata. Are <coughs> Excuse me. I have already seen those, uh, let's say, experimental versions of them. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that uh, I made uh, solely based on reversing uh, but it more or less looks like this when they infect you. So in case of Turla, it has to be dropped on a, they had to know the topology to use Turla. So they have to map the, the network to know where the exchange server is or something like that. And when they know, they, 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 they deploy different instances that will talk to each other as some kind of peer-to-peer -peer network inside. And they will also talk to the operators outside something like that. So this is, it works like that. Uh, most of these cyber espionage toolkit, they <coughs> works, work like this. Oh, what did I do? Okay. So um, the developers, um, who develops this? Uh, so some samples, they contain some hints uh, because they, they left um, by mistake some names in the commit messages to their version control system. And if you can see it, here you see Gilg, Vlad, Uric. Yeah. According to this uh, uh, kernel mode.info thread, <coughs> it's actually, um, they say, the, moderate, the moderator says that uh, it's, it's the, the work of um, uh, some uh, independent security consultants that they sell they, after that, they sell it to different governments. So this, there is an important conclusion if this is true, because uh, we cannot speak about one Turla group because many people can use it. And that concludes the development part. 
so part two operations, who uses this? Yeah, based on the previous con uh, conclusion, if this is true, what has been written on that uh, kernelmode.info forum, using a word, using an expression Turla group might not be really that uh, good. Uh, a lot of people use it. Uh, because, and also importantly, Turla is just one of the, uh, one of the tools that Turla, Turla group uses. There is, however, a lot of common things. If you look at these, all these incidents, uh, separate incidents, you see the commonalities. And um, while the tool is quite impressive, uh, the operators seem a little bit sloppy. I will tell you some story later on why. And yeah, you will see in, in a while. So what is their countries of interest? Uh, based on this um, screenshot from the BAE systems report from 2014, you can clearly see that they are interested in uh, Europe and uh, more importantly on Central and Eastern Europe. Um, <clears throat> publicly known victims, that's the first one, 2008. Um, Finland, Sweden, uh, Belgium, Belgium uh, yeah, there is more. Uh, and what I want to, uh, to highlight the, is that the operators uh, follow certain staged approach. Uh, and I can name here at least four stages. So stage zero, they have to infect you. Stage one, they, it's the patient zero. It's the military way of saying this, but this is the entry point to the network when they compromise something. Then they want to further compromise the network by performing lateral movements. And only at stage three, they deploy Turla. Yeah, and on each stage, they can actually pull out if it's not interesting, the victim. So I will now uh, quickly um, describe you each, uh, each of the stages. So the first one is the infection vector. So what, what infection vectors do these guys use? So they use the traditional infection vector, which is the spear phishing email, but with kind of interesting exploits. One of them was zero day. Um, they use a lot of watering holes. I will speak about watering holes a little bit more. And also, I've seen them use uh, third party suppliers to jump to the final target. So if there is an organization that uh, has a supplier, it's uh, the big organization might be well protected, but they trust a the supplier that is not that well protected. So if you have this situation in your organizations, pay attention to this kind of stuff. Not, no use of zero day. I, I just said that the one of these was uh, zero day, but this is a pair of exploits. One is the, um, uh, the um, the remote code execution exploit and another is the privilege escalation and only the privilege escalation exploit was a zero day. So as a pair of exploits, I don't consider this zero day. So how does it work, the, the water hauling operation? So <clears throat> first they need to decide which uh, community they want to attack. So for example, let's say they want to attack uh, the ministries of foreign affairs. They like them a lot to attack those. So what would they, they then they, they have to figure out uh, which sites uh, those guys, the employees of Ministry of Foreign Affairs might go to. And it's probably going to be, for example, like embassies, site of embassies or something like that. So they compromise these embassies and they put an iframe into the code that red redirects the victim or the potential victim to something Kaspersky calls mothership. But uh, it's, it's where the exploit kit, it's like the exploit kit, basically. It's where the exploit kit uh, resides. But what is the difference between the <coughs> common crime, crimeware and this is that they, only, they will only choose uh, those guys that they are interested in. So they keep a list on, this expo on the mothership, uh, a list of interesting IPs. That's how they call it. And they compare this with the source IP of the victim. And only when the source IP of the victim uh, is equal to the, one of these interesting IPs, um, the victim is going to be attacked. 
And if, if the victim is successfully attacked, they will install the reconnaissance backdoor, so stage one backdoor or the validation backdoor. That will actually, the Kaspersky calls epic, but you know, it's also called Whipbot, Tavdik, World Cup Sec, whatever. This uh, entry point backdoor will go to the proxy chain and will connect to the same mothership to report. And also the attackers, when they want to administer the control panel on the exploit kit, they will connect to, to the mothership. And I said that the operators are kind of sloppy. This is one of uh, an example uh, of uh, their uh, sloppiness. Uh, they actually left some kind of a way to download the, the control panel from their servers. This is how it looks like. It's an empty one because it's from my virtual machine. I downloaded it, installed it, and then, and then run it. But you can see that they have this interesting IP here, which is empty, but normally it contains some, some victims that they are interested in. <coughs> um, they do perform some fingerprinting of the victims, all the victims, not only the ones that they are interested in, to, to collect versions of uh, you know, the browser plugins that they have installed and stuff like that. They have the admin panel, the, the password uh, check, and you can already see that they probably aren't a native English speaker because there's, it's, it's not a proper English here. They, use, uh, they have a web shell there also. It's like a web shell, nothing, nothing really uh, fancy, but uh, the, the code page here is by default set to a Windows 1251. Anyone knows what that uh, code page means? Anyone? It's a Cyrillic character set, 1251, yes. So imagine there was a victim, interesting victim, they have attacked the victim and the exploit was successful. So stage one starts for that victim. Uh, they, they will drop the initial backdoor, which is uh, the Webbot backdoor. This is a simple backdoor with uh, just a handful of commands, and it has no code in common with Turla. But uh, so I initially I didn't know uh, that it's Turla related when I was reversing it. But there are some hints. Uh, 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 ex these two exports, module start and module stop, they are called. They also exist in Turla, and that instantly someone who knows Turla, it, uh, it makes him think yes, that has to be related to Turla. And indeed, it was. Uh, this um, stage one and stage zero operation is uh, well described in this report, the Kaspersky Lab report. Uh, from my side, I can say um, that um, some, there are some interesting tricks in there. Um, it, has, um, it uses uh, the, the, the delivery uh, agent, the delivery method in the spear phishing emails uses that zero day that I was talking about. Um, that's pretty common, but these two are quite interesting. So, to, to actually to uh, inject code into another process, it, it doesn't use the classic techniques. The classic way would be to call write process memory and then call create remote thread. Here, what, it, what Webot does, it maps um, a same memory section to two different processes. So. It can just write the memory to, uh, to the process where it runs, and it will be available in the second process as well. And then it uses some strange trick in the API code that's called set windows long. It magically run that runs that code in the second process. The effect is that the classic, that the normal sa uh, malware sandboxes, they will lost track of that code. Because what the sandbox, like Cuckoo, what they do is they they try to follow the injected code to different processes. But with these tricks, uh, uh, they probably won't, well, they for sure didn't do it when I was testing it. Maybe they already do, do this, but it was really effective against sandboxing. That's pretty classic stuff there. So if they um, decide to continue exploring the victim, they uh, will go after to compromise more stuff, uh, which uh, is usually called lateral movements. Uh, I don't know who invented that, but... Uh, um, so they, they will first probably replace a Webbot with a less known backdoor, just to 
to get out of the radars uh, of the security companies because Webbot is exposed because it's containing these, um, you know, like email, spear phishing emails that fire eyes or on, on, on all the others they catch. So they have to they have to disappear, and they will go after domain credentials or something like that, you know, so that the network is fully compromised. And those stage zero to stage two are rel relatively short. I think I would say it's rather weeks. But stage three, they decide to, if they decide to keep the network for longer control, long, uh, for exfiltration of documents, <coughs> for example, they will insert Tula. Um, I, as I said, they need to know the topology, they need to know where to place the, the, the one that will connect to the internet in the DMZ. So that one will contain different config than this one and this one. Um, and they will drop these, uh, these turlas on, uh, or snakes on uh, the chosen machines. Um, they use many other tools to, through all the stages. That's a little bit different from Regin, where in Regin everything is uh, integrated into their modular framework. But here they, they actually use a lot of command line. And this stage can last years. I've known, I've known the victim that, that uh, have been compromised for years, really. It's, it's terrible, but it's like that. So, now how to detect Turla? Not, not a very easy task. Um, actually, all the detections that, I, that I've known, that, uh, that I was working on, <coughs> it was never detected by any, any Intel or anything like that. It was always detected by a mistake of either developers or operators. And in case of Regin, for example, uh, there was a, a memory leak in uh, one of the modules. And uh, the modules were, uh, the Regin is sitting inside services.exe. And that memory leak caused uh, the effect that service.exe was growing and growing and growing and making the server to choke. And the organization that uh, it was install, installed there uh, had to reboot this server, and they, they finally got pissed off and called someone to fix the server, and this is how this was detected. So only by mistake. Same with Snake, and this is a very fun uh, story to tell, I think. So uh, a, fr a friend of mine that was working for, uh, that is working also for uh, one of the big organizations in Europe, um, he had a server that was uh, blue screening, crashing, and uh, that um, it was only blue screening when he enabled the IV vendor. I have to pay attention to not say the name of that, that vendor. If I say it, please forget it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they have contacted that IV vendor uh, and, and, and told them, look, um, we have this error here. It says that... Uh, uh, Adaptec Ultra 3 um, driver is causing the system to crash only when we enable your uh, your antivirus agent. Uh, you can you can already guess. I told it at the beginning that Ultra 3 was uh, the service where the snake was uh, masquerading us. And what the AV vendor did, they respond and they said, "Yeah, okay, here is the patch." We are giving you the patch. It will, uh, uh, there will be no conflict with, uh, with your Adaptec driver anymore. So what they actually did, instead of telling the organizations that you have a rootkit on your system, they have actually patched their AV agent to be compatible with that rootkit and not cause the, the server to crash. It's a real story, I mean. So the conclusion from that, the direct conclusion is uh, do not rely on, only on vendors. Uh, talk to your partner organizations, establish relationship and share information. You know, IOCs are not enough, but they definitely help. Uh, you know, all the different uh, online communities, they, uh, they make things better, definitely. Um, yeah, third party suppliers. Um, so, s some speculations on attribution. So, this is a difficult subject in, in general because you cannot say for like 100% where they are coming from or something like that. But 
But here, you know, you have different, uh, like a different um, small indicators that when you take it into the, the bigger pot, you can have a good guess, for example. Anyone knows what Zagruschik means? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it means a bootloader in uh, Russian, for example, you know. And yeah, you have different uh, indicators like that and uh, then you can make your guess. Anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of public. Oh, so it's a slide that I, that I added pretty recently. How does it uh, compare to, to Regin and Greyfish? I didn't work on Greyfish. I did work on Regin, so the information about Greyfish is coming from the Kaspersky lab report. But you can kind of um, see the same directions and the same features that all of them implement. So they have this VFS, for example, that Snake implements uh, inside this uh, encrypted container. But Snake does it so that it's a real NTFS system because it's, it's doing it on a sector basis and the file system driver is the same. It's taken from the operating system. It's just the same file driver the operating system uh, uses. But in Regin is a little bit different. They, they have a, a custom virtual uh, system which is uh, indexed by numbers. So it doesn't, they don't use names even. It, it, it's just the, like a container and slots uh, indexed by, by numbers. I think they actually do it. They couldn't do NTF, NTFS because Regin is a, is a malware that is available for different platforms, you know, routers, uh, stuff like that. And this is, I think, uh, why I guess um, they have chosen to implement uh, something that is uh, quite uh, custom. Greyfish implements it in a registry. Also the communications, uh, you can observe that um, they have uh, <coughs> kind of a flexible way to, to use different uh, communication channels. Um, uh, nodes form a kind of peer-to-peer -peer network, especially in Regin, it's, 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 it's very nicely uh, uh, solved, but that's, I think, not yet public, so I won't speak about that, just to be sure. <laughs> now. Now, there are also some differences uh, um, that the creators of this toolkit took. And, and um, the one that I saw is in, in the mechanism that how they hide. Uh, so today, at, uh, in the morning, uh, David Barroso, he, he had a slide with, uh, with the circles and the rings. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, Greyfish or the equation malware, they probably will be hiding in ring minus three, which is a firmware, a disk firmware or something like that. But on the other hand, I have observed uh, in Regin, for example, that um, they can use a quite opposite technique that uh, we, might, we, may, we might call uh, hiding in plain sight. So they actually might not use kernel mode code in all and, uh, at all and, and just run in plainly in, in, in user mode. Uh, and First of all, it's way cheaper because imagine, imagine uh, you know, uh, creating this firmware uh, sitting, the malware that sits in the different vendors, uh, the disks of different vendors, it must have costed a fortune. I know it's NSA, they have money, but still, I mean, they have to, uh, to count it. And so yeah, so I see the two uh, opposite directions that might be taken by, by these different authors, which is kind of, kind of cool. The, the, the other difference is in the architecture. A lot of these frameworks are modular. So Snake is kind of monolithic, I would say. They, they use, is at the basic platform, but then they use uh, independent tools uh, from the command line. So the operators can, can actually, uh, they have to be able to use the command line. For example, in Regin, it's not the case. Everything is integrated into their, their toolkit. And I think that uh, in case of Regin, uh, they can have a less skilled operators that do not necessarily uh, are masters in command line. I think it also depends on who this toolkit is operated uh, by. Uh, yeah, but that's just, uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting this, uh, to, to speculate on how it, how it will look like uh, in the future when they when it will, uh, the development will progress, because it will progress for sure. 
And yeah, on that note, uh, I want to conclude. And I don't know, do we ha still have time for some questions? Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, yeah. No questions? I have one. Yeah. What kind of documents and information they have exfiltrated? With kind, with Intel, they were interested in, for example, CAD documents. Oh, uh, what? Finance. So what they what they are after? Um, yeah, they're mostly after after documents. I I don't exactly know which kind of documents, but I suspect uh, some confidential uh, documents, uh, things like that. Yeah. question about the cooperation between companies among different companies because as you have said there were companies like GData, BAE, Kaspersky, yeah. many others that were researching on the same topic. Yeah. What do you think? Was there a real cooperation between those companies and also you guys when you were researching or was something more isolated? Sometimes there is a cooperation between, between companies but most of the time it's kind of separated. They, 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 they would rather compete with each other in their research than, than cooperate, I think. I'm speaking about security vendors because, you know, non-security vendors like regular companies, they, they are more likely to cooperate. But, you know, those vendors, they, sometimes the, the researchers from those vendors cooperate on a personal level, but I rarely see the cooperation on the company's level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Yeah.